Hello, my name is Daniel Stilwell. I am the editor of the IFTA e-newsletter, and we occasionally talk to different academics and researchers and clinicians from around the world uh, about their work and interests that they have. And today we have with us uh, Dr. Ruben Paracardona. Um, he is at the University of Texas at Austin at the Steve Hicks School of Social Work. Um, that's in the US. And he is going to be the plenary speaker for this upcoming Congress um, in just a couple of weeks. So please, if you have not decided to come and you have the opportunity to go to Puerto Rico, we would love to have you. Um, so welcome, Dr. Para Cardona. Can I call you Ruben? Absolutely, please. All right. So uh, my first question is a generic one, since we have clinicians watching or reading our stuff from around the world. What kind of mental health practitioner do you identify as? And what does that look like in your context? Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. It's a joy having this uh, time to speak with you and with viewers. And also thank you to uh, IFTA for the amazing opportunity to, to speak this year. It's, it's truly an honor. So I'm, I'm very grateful. So uh, first of all, uh, my gratitude. Um, I'm a family therapist by training. I completed, um, well, let's say going back my undergraduate degree in community psychology in Mexico. That really was a, a very important period in my professional development because that's when I identify myself with psychology of liberation, Martin Baró, and all these uh, psychologists who were really engaged in the fight for uh, human rights and uh, social justice in Central America in a very tumultuous time. And uh, so that undergrad education really, really solidified my identity in terms of everything I wanted to accomplish. Uh, I'm originally from Chihuahua, Mexico, uh, but I always wanted to complete my uh, graduate education in the United States, and uh, that's when I was able to secure support and complete my master's in family therapy at uh, Syracuse University, which is an amazing program, very experiential, very intense program at the time, very strong emphasis on multiculturalism. And then I moved to Texas Tech uh, to complete my PhD program in family therapy as well. And uh, really extraordinary experiences I had. In terms of my clinical orientation, uh, definitely the systems thinker, uh, experiential family therapy has been at the core of my work. Contextual family therapy in terms of justice across generation has been something that has informed my work. But uh, my trajectory in my professional life has been in a way that I have used all my clinical training to work in communities. Like I don't have a private practice, but all the work that we do in communities heavily influenced, heavily informed by my identity as a family therapist. So I would say those are my clinical orientations and I will talk about those in the, in the plenary. Uh, but in terms of the day-to-day -day practice of mental health is in communities, in underserved communities, that's where I, that's where I feel very alive and that's where I see my, my mission is. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, with your research and your writing, um, that often seems to have that clinic, uh, that community engagement piece built into it. So it's so important as systems thinkers to be working in systems. Yes. Thank you, then. Yes. Wonderful. Um, all right. So your plenary, let me get out the proper official title. Your plenary is entitled Implementing Community-Based Prevention with Latinx Populations by Integrating Family Therapy Core Theories, Rigorous Science, and social justice. So that's a lot of words. <laughs> what does that mean? Give us a sneak peek to what you're going to be talking about um, in just a couple of weeks. You know, I continue to reflect about this presentation, and I think I will start with a little bit of a reflection of where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. We've come through very tumultuous times as a humanity. In the United States, we come from uh, still recovering from an administration in which we witness uh, really intense violations of human rights, particularly on a diverse populations. So I will talk a little bit about that. And then absolutely COVID, absolutely mm -hmm. COVID. Um, I would like this uh, presentation to be a tribute to everyone that we have lost. Um, many of us have been touched in so many ways about that. I have mm -hmm. lost friends, very close relatives. But we're also entering a phase that is uh, tricky because there's continues to be populations that continue to be overlooked and continue to be affected by COVID. Right. And, and this is where structural and historical injustices 
make a mark because those are the ones more impacted just as they were impacted with COVID. So mm -hmm. when I reflect about COVID, I will talk about COVID, the impact on everyone, but also about the populations that were impacted most because of issues of historical injustice. And I, I think my fear right now that we are moving into this phase of quote unquote going back to normalcy is that the snapshot that we saw of tremendous health disparities in tremendous disparities among different populations that we're gonna forget about that as well. Mm -hmm. So one of the silver linings of COVID was that it was like, who's dying and who's dying that fast is tied to historical injustice. So I will reflect a little bit about that. And then I will move to our story. It's, this, it's a story, it's a story. Hopefully uh, the audience will take many takeaways from our story, but I have always been concerned about the extraordinary training we get as family therapists, but who benefits from that? Mm. When I was going through my graduate programs, it was a struggle for me that, um, you know, the, the workers that I know were working on construction, on roofs, on landscaping, all Latinos, would not ever think, would never think about going to a university-based family therapy clinic, right? It, because they, they perceived it as a, as a white dominant institution, or it was, even physically far away from them, or even a sliding scale, they just could not afford those services. So I always wanted to, 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 to find a way to utilize my training to bring services to underserved populations. So I will tell our story. I will tell our story about how I focus on parenting because parenting is a beautiful prevention um, aspect to secure the lives of children and youth, and particularly, among underserved populations that are exposed to so much stress. So I will talk about our journey. How is it that we got into communities to make it a truly participatory approach? How is it that we design studies to overtly address racism and discrimination in the mm. mental health interventions we do? Because many times we don't, particularly with manualized interventions. And how is it that now we're thinking about scaling up those um, services? And, and it's gonna be just a, a food for thought in terms of as family therapists, even from the private clinical practice or consulting or working with communities, how is it that we can, can continue to bring down those barriers of services and mental health disparities? Because the expertise we have as family therapists is tremendous, but the, the barriers to bring that expertise to populations who are in most need of those services are also very uh, big. And, and I think a lot of the ways to tackle that down is by finding alternatives. So we insert ourselves in communities rather than expecting communities to come to us. Wonderful, wonderful. And I, I think that having someone like you who's been on the ground doing this is going to be really important because I find that most plenaries do a good job of inspiring, but not necessarily always having those concrete or practical or connected elements. Um, so you being able to talk about the big ideas and what it can actually look like is, is wonderful. Um, we do have a, you know, a global audience for this. Um, how do you see some of these ideas being generalized or translatable to people in other countries or other contexts? Yeah, you know, just before um, joining this call, I was having a, a conversation with some colleagues because we're gonna be working with UNICEF on rolling out parenting programs in Latin America. So we were talking about examples in uh, Southeast Asia, South Africa, uh, South America. So I will bring some of those international examples in the, in, in the ways we're working, particularly beautiful example we have is in Chile. We're doing a very nationwide dissemination of parenting programs uh, in the country. And, and, and you know, you have to develop as a systems thinker, you need to develop those skills in the political realm. So we mm. work with that very strong foundation. We work with governments, we work with mental health institutions and research organizations. So how is it that we get out of our comfort zone, right, as family therapists and utilize those systems uh, way of thinking and the way we're received by international organizations is quite fascinating. Mm. Because when you go to the health of ministry, uh, Ministry of Health, and you say, hey, I'm trained in these mental health prevention programs. I can offer this solution. They are like all over. Mm -hmm. Please help us. How do we make it happen? So I think a lot of the 
you know, food for thought will be, um, I think in the beginning for me, I was not unclear about the impact I could have in communities. But the more I reach to state government, federal governments, and now international organizations, the more I'm amazed at how, uh, how much receptive they are towards please help us with this mandate that providing care for our families, providing mental health for our communities. So I will also talk about our international experiences, some uh, failures that we have because we did not think enough at a systemic levels, but also some successes and mm -hmm. invitations for folks to, to duplicate those experiences because we're truly needed and we have a very important contribution to offer. Wonderful. Thank you. for, And that's also just a good reminder, I think, for all of us to look outside of our bubble and yes. see where we can participate in those ways. And, you know, the point that you make about community prevention, I think that connects to what you were saying about COVID is it's, we almost had to wait to see where people were dying in order to see the inequities and, you know, inefficiencies in the system. And that's wrong. Like that is, that is not what we are trained to do. We, we, we are supposed to be getting in there and helping people before the, everyone starts dying um, and being able to reform the system and create a social justice framework that supports ahead of disaster. Um, it, it's so yeah, important. Exactly. And you know, something I've seen with my US born, uh, US, US born and US based colleagues is they are very accountable for their privilege. But many times I've seen how that accountability is like a like a barrier for them to engage because they 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 say to me, I, I cannot offer anything to Malaysia because I'm gonna come across as imperialistic. But the reality is the opportunities for growth and professional development with it, we have in the US are extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So the process is not shying away from that, but coming to the table and say, this is me, this is what I have to offer. How can I help? And the process of communication and interaction is quite fascinating. So I see, I see many times fail opportunities because I, I see my colleagues like withdrawing from that process rather than saying, okay, this is me. So I think the reaching out is a very important component because as you mentioned, COVID indicated to us pervasive inequities across social strata and across countries. And, and, and we're truly needed mm -hmm. and in terms of, uh, and I'm talking about international collaborations those international collaborations are truly needed to move us forward as humanity. That's what I believe. Right. And as, as someone myself who either has or presents with so many of those privileges, um, I've had to learn the hard way that it's not necessarily about cultural competence and getting it right. It's about cultural humility and yes. coming in as, as, a, as a useful tool or resource for others to take advantage of instead of trying to dictate things. Exactly, because then our international colleagues, they take that knowledge, they transform it, they ground it. It's, mm. it's all collaborative process that is important. You grow as a result, they grow as a result, and ultimately who benefits are those underserved populations that would not have been served otherwise. Wonderful. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, one last question. Is there anything else that you'd like to share about yourself per personally or professionally, um, some interest, hobby, or maybe something you're doing research on now? You know, um, that, that's a fascinating question. And I think what I would like to share is that um, this conference th comes at a time in my personal life and that I'm very grateful for this invitation because I think we need to celebrate life. Mm. And, and, and um, there's been many losses for many of us. And I think, uh, I hope the tone of this presentation ultimately is about a presentation of celebration of life. And, and, and also, how is it that we can help others continue to celebrate life, particularly those who have been oppressed and continue to be oppressed? So I think this interview, being at the conference, experiencing that sense of community, being in person with other human beings whose desire is to make a difference, uh, if we can celebrate both things, is a sense of community and a sense of life and being grateful that mm. we are alive. I think more than ever, we have come to realize the tremendous privilege of being alive. So I think if we can give that tone to that presentation, that would be amazing. That is a wonderful tone to bring to so many things. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, and uh, hopefully people will recognize your face and your voice, and your name, and they'll come say hi um, in Puerto Rico in just a couple of days away. I know, a few days. I cannot believe it.
looking forward right. to it. And thank you so much, Daniel, for your kindness and for this time. My pleasure.